Jesus, but would you just, in your Bible, this is not on the overhead, so don't panic back there. Matthew chapter 24, verse 6. Matthew 24, verse 6. I know you're very aware of what's going on in our world today, what's happening. Amen. And, uh, but I want, I want to expand on that if I could. Uh, give me the definition for toxic, if you would. Do that for me. Amen. There it is. Toxic, extremely harsh, malicious, or harmful, infectious, often caused from bitterness. Bitterness is causing painful emotions felt or experienced in a strong and unpleasant way angry and unhappy because of unfair treatment. I, I looked this up because I just wanted to know. I know you know about the, the war, the conflict with Russia and Ukraine right now. And again, you, you have to pray for them. But you have to also, in not trying to uh, belittle what's happening there, did you know they're still killing people in Syria? It never stopped. We just took our news away from it. There are 195 countries on our globe, 195. Looked this up yesterday, just wanted to know. And I asked a question, out of 195, how many of those countries are in war and conflict? Anybody want to take a quick guess? 174 are in conflict or in war. And when I read that, you know, because our eyes right now are on uh, what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, we yet to recognize and realize that this world has never stopped war and conflicts. It's the, the greediness. I think the scripture calls it the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. These are the things that cause that. Uh, absolute power corrupts absolutely. You put leaders with absolute power in, and they start becoming corrupt. Uh, the hardship on the one we're dealing with right now is the fact there are nuclear bombs. Uh, that could very easily, out of pride, be detonated. So we don't know. What, but I came to church this morning with serenity, peace, knowing that what a great country that we live in, that uh, if, if you don't own a gun, lift your hand. I'd love you. If you want one, let your boy do. Okay, one person in this whole church don't own a gun. You see why I asked that way. You know, because the bottom line is we will not be invaded or they'd be stupid to invade us because we all have a way to defend ourselves. So this is where the world that we're living in today. So when I looked at 195 countries and 174 of them are in conflict, I went back to Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, that says, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. This is Jesus talking about when he comes again. See that you are not troubled it's okay not to be troubled amen see that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass but the end is not yet for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there will be famines pestilence earthquakes in various places all these are the beginning of sorrow now however you look at your eschatology which means the the end of the world that all of this has already happened, this has continued to happen. It hasn't stopped yet. But the issue is, is the escalation of it. And when you've got 195 countries in the world and 174 of them are in conflict or war, then you realize we have an escalation. Amen. We're moving up, up, and we're being drawn into them also. And will be, and always have been. So I want you not to be so troubled, but I want you to pray for them. Pray for their peace. Pray for the children. Amen. And whatever we can do. I have missionary friends that I know in Russia and in Ukraine. They have powerful churches. I'm talking about 5,000 people in their church. Some of the, the, the finest churches you've ever seen are in those, those places right now. And you say, I didn't know that. And that's what's happening. So those churches are rising up. You know what pastors are saying over there? We ain't leaving. Amen. We're staying here. And so we got to stand with them and believe God for the good. Because I'm a kingdom man. You know, if there's one place where boundaries don't matter, it's in the kingdom. Amen. It expands around the world. We're a part of that. So I want to talk to you today about toxic, amen, toxicity. And when I say toxic, I want to tell you, that when I look at this, that, go back, please, amen. When I look at this, extremely harsh, malicious, or harmful, infectious, theologies can become toxic, amen. How you believe about God can become toxic. There are toxic leaders in the world, as we have seen, amen. There are toxic pastors. There are toxic church folk, amen. There are toxic owners of business that some of you have worked for, toxicity in our family, 
So all of these things take place. And when you see that, you have to begin to ask yourself, how do I deal with these people? How do I deal with this thing here? Amen. And so when I, I read this, I realize we, when, when we can't walk away from toxic people, walk away. Amen. Sometimes we can walk away. We usually should. But when financial necessity, work obligation, sometimes we're stuck in a, in a place where we have to be with them. Amen. Family relationships or even the accomplishment of our God-given mission necessitates that we find a way to live or work with a toxic person. Uh, we can learn much from following Jesus' example and how he dealt with Judas. When I see Jesus and Judas, I see such a, 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 a paradigm. I, I, I look at a, the righteousness of God wrapped up in flesh, and I see a man who was all decided as Judas was to steal and to take, and, and he got angry and he got hurt. And, and yet Jesus, what he did, he kept him. He kept him around. He didn't get rid of It didn't happen to the very end. And Jesus didn't get rid of Judas. Judas read himself of Jesus. Amen. So there was a difference there. Though Jesus often walked away and let others walk away, he obviously and clearly kept one toxic person very close to his side, his betrayer. As a matter of fact, if you study the difference in Judas and Peter, you'd say to yourself, Peter would be the failure and Judas would be the success because he was a businessman. And yet it wasn't that way. So understanding this, we're going to focus on a few things here. First off, Jesus didn't view his mission as stopping toxic people from sinning. That's funny, isn't it? Amen. He didn't go around just trying to stop toxic people. That was not his mission in life. Now, I know I'm not talking to anyone in this building today, I'm talking to those watching online. All right? But a lot of folk feel like it's their mission to be fruit inspectors, amen, to go around and, and to make sure that people stop doing certain things. John chapter 12, verse 4 says, one of Jesus' disciples, Judas, who was later to betray him, objected. Why was it this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Remember the story. Mary has uh, unleashed her hair. She's wiped his feet. with. Uh, as a matter of fact, she, she's had tears on him. She, she takes perfume, the alabaster. She breaks the alabaster. Once you break it, you can't get it back in the bottle. The perfume is emitting all through the air, and she's weeping over his feet and she's white and then and the scripture says this literally is enough money in that little vase if you would to uh for a whole year's wages and yet if you got to imagine what you make a year and would you give up that one year for that one moment and jesus said leave her alone this is done as a memorial for her therefore we've never forgot her sometimes you got to break a vase in life can i get an amen Amen. You got to do something a little extraordinary for Christ. You got to you got to just go outside the box, if you would. And that's what she did. Well, that upset Judas. Well, as a matter of fact, it didn't upset him. It was a setup. As a matter of fact, when he saw that, and he said, "You know, this money could be given to the poor. If you wanted to touch Jesus' buttons, if you wanted to hit a button that he had, talk about the poor. He was all for the poor. He was all for the downcast. He was all for those that were hurting physically and spiritually and mentally. And so when Judas said, "Poor, oh man, he's going for it." And sometimes people know where your button is told you this last week, and they'll hunt for it and find it. And Judas found it. He touched the word poor there. He said it was worth more than a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared. He said about the poor, but because he was a thief. He was toxic. He was dangerous. Amen. And as a keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. That means, uh, you know, uh, the nine for you and one for me. And, and he would slide money over to himself. As a matter of fact, he was sandbagging, if you would, the finances that the disciples were getting. And how many know if you want to make money, hang out with Jesus? Mm, come on now. Amen. He can find money in a fish's mouth. Amen. People, want, people give to good ministry. It's just the way people are. They see ministry. They see how it helps. They see how it blesses. They give to it. Now, they, there's no better, greater ministry than Jesus. So here's Judas following along with him. I mean, even Peter, James, and John knew if you wanted to go fishing, take Jesus. Yeah, there'd be more enough fish to go around and feed the village there. So if John knew, and John's the writer here, if John knew that Judas was a thief, then you know that Judas, that Jesus knew that Judas was a thief. In fact, Jesus knew that Judas was worse than a thief. In John chapter 6, verse 70, he said, Have I not chosen the, you, the 12? Did I not pick all 12 of you? And by the way, one of you is a devil. Ooh. That'd be like me gathering the whole staff of the little country church together and say, Did I pick all of you? Huh. And one of y'all is a devil. 
I mean, I can see it right now. David looking at Joseph. Joseph looking at David. And here's across the room. We're kind of gathering around. Because that's what they did. They would, they would look at each other. Go, I wonder, wonder who he's talking about here. So Jesus knew Judas was toxic, and he could have stopped Judas from stealing and his future betrayal by kicking him out of the group. He could have done that. John chapter 13, 27, which tells us about, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later. But right now, he mentions about Judas. As, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus said, I know you're a devil. Now Satan's entered into him. And he said, what are you about to do? Do quickly, Jesus told him. You know, the scripture tells us in the book of Psalms, which was over a thousand years before this happened, that there would come along one that was going to kick Jesus with a foot, was going to trip him. I've often used the phrase kick with a clean foot because Judas' foot had been washed by Christ. And after that washing of his feet, Judas turned around and kicked him with it. Psalm 41, 9, even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. So why didn't Jesus kick him out? You've got to keep the bigger picture in mind. Seeking God's kingdom first. And this is what's important. That's why Jesus said, when you see wars and rumors of wars, don't be troubled. You've got to keep the, your eyes on the kingdom. Amen. And what's really important here, he had to raise up a band of disciples. He also had to die on the cross. He wasn't waylaid by individual petty battles that his disciples were going through, whether uh, G, uh, Peter was upset over John and asking for forgiveness seven times 70, as we're prone to do with people around us. Addressing Judas's thievery would be like a neurosurgeon clipping someone's fingernails. There, there were more important issues at hand. Listen, there are more important issues at hand than dealing with the same old toxic people over and over again. Amen? And Jesus' mission was not to stop everybody from sinning. Don't let the small things take away you from the bigger picture. Many of us, we think our goal in life as believers in Christ is to make sure everybody around us don't sin like us. Mm -hmm. So a freeing word for me, amen, to realize that our mission is not to confront everybody's sin you hear or know or even among your uh, perhaps toxic family members or coworkers. Of course, you know, if you're a parent of a child and the child is a little bit toxic, I understand staying with them. I understand working with them. You, know, you can't separate yourself. You've got to learn how to deal with it. So as we move through that, Jesus could have spent all 24 hours of every day trying to confront every one of his disciples' sins. Peter, put away your anger. Put up that sword. Thomas, why are you still doubting me? Amen. Thaddeus, you're a people pleaser. You're just a suck up. He could have dealt with all 12 all the time. Amen. Over and over again. Instead, he focused on training and equipping reliable people. And this is something you got to learn to do. You got to find the good in the mess. Amen. And when you find the one that you can pour your life into, that's important. Focusing on others' sin makes you focus on what's toxic. Always looking at that. Focusing on training makes you focus on what is good and on who is reliable. The latter is much more enjoyable. I'd encourage you to do that. So because our goal is to seek first God's kingdom and righteousness and to seek our out reliable people in the process, we've got to let a few things slide right by us. As a pastor, when I first started pastoring, I remember, Kenny, it seemed like all the people I was gathering, you know, I used to use this phrase. Every loose nut wants to find out if you're the boat they belong to. And they show up at church, and, you know, I was down at the hotel here and starting church, and, and, and toxic people, they find you. I had a pastor call me last week and warn me of uh, somebody who was toxic in his church and said, beware if this person shows up because I told her you were my friend. Well, thanks a lot, buddy. Amen. But I, I'm used to dealing with it. But here's the thing. I don't give them a time of day. Amen. I don't allow it to distract me from my mission. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, the more you can help people that way, they, they, they begin to lose their toxicity. Here's what I really believe in. I know that a bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. But I've also believed in the opposite. Maybe the world won't tell you this, but you hang out with good people, you often become better. Amen. I often say if you drink after me, you get well. So you say, well, I drink after somebody sick, I get sick. Okay, well, if I drink after somebody well, get well. It's part of how you believe. Can I get an amen? Amen. So you've got to hang on to a belief system. You know, that uncle who brings another woman half his age to your Thanksgiving dinner? Not our problem. It's going to be his later. The co-worker who had too much to drink at the office party. If we're not the boss, that's not our concern. Besides, one sin is never the issue. Alienation from God, shattered psyches, unhealed and unaddressed hurts. Those are the real issues. Feel free to enjoy people. Amen. And to, and to love them without having to serve as their conscience. You don't need to be there. I've often said to other people, why are you trying to be my Holy Ghost? I got a Holy Ghost. Amen. Some folks feel like they're destined. They got to be the one. They got that prophet anointing. 
Amen. Before long, they profit lying. Amen. So when asked sincerely, speak the truth. Just know that merely witnesses sin in your presence doesn't require you to act as a prosecuting attorney, judge, and jury. Keep the bigger picture in mind. Instead of upending the holiday gathering by making sure everyone knows you disapprove of what that child, that cousin, that uncle, that parent is doing, find a hungry soul. Find somebody that just wants to know more about God, amen, or maybe about uh, something that you do, and pour your life into them. When I first got born again, I had to be very careful because I was that guy to go around and point out things. I'd jump in the car with somebody, and, and I, I would I'd throw their joints out or dump their cigarettes or pour out their beer. It's a wonder I'm alive. Amen. I was that guy. I, w- I was always going around trying to point sin out to other people because I felt like I was so much better at the time because God had cleaned me up. But after so many years of life, I realized that I need mercy. I need grace. I need the help of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I just, actually, I became a little toxic even after I got born again. So keep the bigger picture in mind. Go after reliable people that you can pour into. Second, second thing here, Jesus didn't let Judas' toxicity become his. Amen. He didn't allow what Judas was doing to become his. Uh, how much money would you spend to get an hour with Jesus and just ask him a question or two? What, what, would, you, would you love to have just a little time? And what questions would you ask him? I know the first one would be, what, where'd you come from? Don't ask that. Okay, let's not go there with, with Jesus. I wouldn't do that with him. Amen. But, but to be able to talk with him, and all of us, all of which makes Judas' betrayal seem the all more ungrateful. How could he spend three years with Jesus, camp out with Jesus, see the miracles of Jesus, and all these things, and still be ungrateful? Amen. Jesus gave him a front row seat to the most significant life ever lived, and Judas sold him out. Amen. He washed his feet at the Last Supper when Jesus took the disciples, amen, all of them, and laid them in the circles there and began to wash their feet. He took those hands, those two precious hands, holy hands, amen, those, those hands that affected humankind, those hands that were pierced for our salvation. He took those exquisite hands, and he washed the feet of this toxic. He knew who he was. Even when he got to Peter, Peter said, don't wash my feet. Well, and Jesus said, don't wash your feet. You don't have no part with me. He was teaching us to serve one another. But when he got to Judas, even in the face of ungratefulness and malice, he kept the door open to a relationship, amen, for a reconciliation, for Judas to do the right thing. Listen to me. You can't make me hate you, Judas. That's what he's saying. Amen. Your toxicity won't become my toxicity. In other words, there are times people want you to be like them. Don't be like them. Don't allow it to get into your life and infest you. Amen. Just as, and again, one of the definitions about toxicity is that it is infectious. Amen. It can make you bitter. It can make you mean. So what happened during this act of betrayal when Judas walks up to Jesus to hand him over to the soldiers there in Gethsemane? Jesus been praying, not my will, but thine be done. He said it three times. Let this cup pass from me. A part of that cup is what Judas was going to do to him. And the scripture says in the book of of Matthew 26, verse 47, while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the 12, arrived with him with a large crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them, and the one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. That tells me that Jesus looked like us. He didn't just stand out like many think he did. He looked like us. Amen. I can see him with a beard, long flowing hair. The Scripture speaks of him pulling his beard, so I know he had a beard. Amen. I see him uh, in, in, his, in his whatever, the flowing outfit he had. He probably dirty from laying on the ground a lot, one pair of sandals. And here comes Judas up to the side, going to the place, the ones where Judas was. He said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. Jesus replied, do what you came for, friend. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. Friend, why not skunk? Why not snake? Jesus said, friend, because Jesus didn't have a toxic molecule in his body. Amen. He did not allow what Judas was doing to make him different. There was nowhere for toxicity to take root inside of him. God is radically for people. He wants everyone to be changed. Amen. Everybody to be born again. First Timothy 2, 4, who wants all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. So as his followers, we also have to be around everyone, and every now and then somebody going to oppose you. You know, the Scripture teaches us something that's real hard for us to do. Don't do to them what they've done to you. Amen. Learn how to love, learn how to cover, learn how to be a blessing. But don't, if they, if they mean toward you, it doesn't mean for you to be mean back toward them. Hard thing to do, isn't it? Oh, tell the truth, shame the devil. 
Oh, if you jack with me, I jack with you. You wave at me with one thing, I'm going to wave back at you. You show your gun, I'll show my gun. Amen. It's so hard for us to be like Jesus. And yet the Scripture tells us over and over not to return evil for evil. Amen. Not, not to do it. And Jesus, I love Jesus, is so much that he spoke, cra- he spoke truth to crazy. Even now, you know what, cra- you've been around crazy people? It's funny how today people think being crazy is a badge of honor. Amen. It's not. Amen. It's the next toward, the step toward insanity. Amen. To being on your way out. Stay sane. While Jesus invited Judas into the relationship until the very moment of betrayal, washing his feet, even calling him friend, he never pretended that Judas was doing, was it toxic. In fact, he warned Judas at the Last Supper that if he were to go through with his plans, things wouldn't end well for him. As a matter of fact, Mark chapter 14, verse 17, when evening came, Jesus arrived with the twelve. While they were reclining at the table eating, he said, truly, I tell you, one of you is going to betray me, one who's eating with me. Again, the looks. You know, they're looking around the room. Which one is it? Amen. Thomas got his head down. He don't know. He's doubting whether he can pull this off. Amen. So here they are. They were saddened. And one, of, and one by one, they began to say, surely you don't mean me. You don't mean me. It is the one of the twelve, he replied, one who dips bread into the bowl with me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. Watch. But woe to him. Woe to that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Jesus spoke truth to crazy. He said, you want to do this thing? It would be better if you would not have been born. When Judas kissed him in Gethsemane, the word was, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When working around toxic people, you don't have to pretend they're not toxic. You don't have to pretend they're not crazy. Amen. Well, what you're doing, uh, you don't have to pretend that they are well-meaning, but maybe they're just misguided and they need a little bit of help. The reason this is good news is that it helps preserve your sanity. Amen. Toxic people are experts at twisting things. They make us feel crazy for admitting the truth. But as followers of Jesus, we're committed to the truth. When you know the truth, truth sets you free. Amen. I no longer have to be bound by your craziness and your toxicity. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. So here it is. Uh, Craziness is a clear sign of toxicity. Let me give you some other signs. Self-absorbed shows a lack of concern for others. Touchy. Very sensitive. I've been called the opposite. But man ain't got no sensitivity at all. I'm learning. I'm learning to be a little bit more sensitive. Becomes possessive of a few friends. Has an unusual fear of losing them. Toxic. Once they connect to you, they, they don't want to let you go. And if you do leave, then they're going to hate you. Shows little or no gratitude. Extremes. Speaks words of empty flattery or harsh criticism. Holds grudges against people. They dead and gone, and you're still mad at them. Has a stubborn, sulky attitude. Again, this has none of you, them that are watching me right now. Possibly unwilling to share, mood, extremes. See, toxic people are often bitter people. Hebrews 12 is a warning to us, verse 15. See to it that no one misses the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. Again, we've often said the fruit's in the root. The root is so important. Bitterness is, again, causing painful emotions felt or experienced in a strong and unpleasant way, angry and unhappy because of unfair treatment. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine in Montana this week. He told me it was 29 below. While we were talking, I told him about a friend of mine that years ago told me this, and I've never, ever forgot it, and I call it the four A's. Ang- uh, go to the next one, and I'll come back to it. There it is, the four A's. Anger always assassinates authority. Whenever you're angry, uh, Tommy, you run the business. When people get angry at you, anger always assassinates authority. We find a way to point a finger at somebody else because of the, they're the authority. He made, and I don't know why, but it just always comes back that way. Uh, hurt, hurt. Was Judas hurt? Yeah. Why was he hurt? Because Jesus talked to crazy. Amen. When he said, uh, this money could be used for the poor, Jesus said, oh, this is done as a memorial for her. Leave her alone. This is be done as a memorial for her. Well, she ain't supposed to be even in the room with us, Jesus. 
Women ain't allowed in our culture to even come in the room. And yet she comes in, she lays down her hair. You know about the, 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 what she really is? She's a prostitute. And you're going to let this woman in here and let down her hair and cry? Amen. been to be over here and break this out of bed. What are you doing here, Jesus? Leave her alone. Hurt. Whenever you get hurt, you have to be careful with it because all of us are going to get hurt. We, we made to get hurt. We are emotional people. So when we get hurt, when we get slighted, when, when something takes place in our life, then, then hurt turns to bitterness. Amen. It, it tries to cause root inside of you. Husbands get hurt. Wives get hurt. Children get hurt. What you say to your kids, be careful of the words you say to your kids. Amen. Because they cause bitterness inside of them. Amen. And that bitterness can come forward, and, and it manifests as hatred and anger. Amen. And Jesus said, when you hate your brother, you're guilty of murder. And this is what's happening we see in the world. 174 countries conflicted and at war with one another. What's going on? This is going on. People are bitter. They're toxic. Amen. They're running nations. They're ruling over others. And when that happens, next thing you got is murder. And anger always assassinates authority. So you got to be careful. It's okay to be angry. Ephesians says be angry. Don't sin. I can be mad. What's what I've been to do? I'm going to walk away. <laughs> I'm going to walk away. I, I, I've walked away from my kids. I've walked away from my wife. I've walked, I've walked away from y'all. I just turn around and say, give me a minute or, or 30 or an hour. Give me a little time because I got to let this anger settle inside me. Amen. I got to get it out because I don't want it to turn to bitterness. I don't want it to turn to anger and hatred. If it does, I'll start hating you. Amen. I don't want to hate you because if I hate you, I'm not, I'm not being a brother. Amen. John tells me. Uh, th that we love one another. Amen. That's what separates us from all other people. It ain't the color of our skin. Amen. Or the economy or where we're at in life. It's the fact that we love one another. Amen. I don't care where you're from. If I love you, if you're, if you're from Jesus, I love you. Amen. So here's what I want to tell you. Here, here's what I would do. It sounds a little cliche. I know. But I found that extra praying brings some level of sanity to a situation that feels crazy. Some extra praying. Amen. When I say praying, I'm talking about getting along with Jesus and talking to him and reminding yourself what he would do. There's something about spending time talking to and listening to the, the God of truth that restores sanity when you're focused to spend time in a place that makes you feel like you're losing your mind. So as we trust that God understands all that is truly going on, and as we remember that God is the only one capable of bringing everyone else into account, he's going to do that. We can rest in an understanding and a promise and protection. Philippians chapter 4, amen, verse 6 says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Somebody said to me this morning, don't you worry. <sighs> it's like hearing uh, refreshment in my spirit. Don't you worry. I found that worry is a noose around your neck that will tighten with anxiety to the point of choking off real life. When the pandemic hit, the Holy Ghost said, don't you worry. Hallelujah. Hadn't been worried. I don't worry. I don't worry about my wife. Amen. Pastor, she got cancer. I know. It's a journey. We all got on a journey. Amen. You're all going to get something. Amen. We're all going to go through something. We've already gone through something. Amen. Why would you be excluded in life? Don't worry. Amen. Love God through it all. Amen. Because if I worry, I'm, I'm, I'm falling into the devil's trap. I'm not going to worry. Amen. I'm going to pray. Pray. That's what it says. Let petitions and praises. Shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. Before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Amen. In closing, let me give you some takeaways here real quick. Some things you can take away with you. Please write these down on your phone. Amen. If you go to my phone, I have places I write things down. I've learned how to use that part of that. If necessary, write it on the back of your Bible. But sometimes we can't walk away, but we have to learn how to live or work around toxic people, and it's going to require us to become stronger than we've ever been before. It'd be nice to say, I, I don't have to be around them, and the issue for me is for you is to learn how to not allow you to become toxic. Amen. Be that one person everybody likes to be around. Hallelujah. Amen. Everybody likes to be around. So first, don't try to control a controller. Don't try to control a controller. Now, again, I'm not talking to anyone in this room. But you know, I, I'm a little bit of a controller at times. Amen. I like, to, I like to see things go the way I want it to go. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm after things that I, I walk around, but I found out there are things I cannot control. Amen. And whatever, you, listen, whatever you cannot control, don't let it control you. If you can't control it, I can't control what's going on right now in Russia and Ukraine. I can't control what's going on in Syria. I can't control what's going on in Northern Africa. But I can do my best to be a blessing here. Amen. But don't, don't try to control a controller. Work around them as you're required to. But don't let their ups and their downs and their mood swings become your ups and downs and mood swings. Keep a healthy level of distance between the two of you. Next thing, keep first things first. We use the term priorities. Keep things priorities. Dominoes falling. Keep that first domino and then take care of it. First things first, so important. Our job isn't to stop people from sinning. Focus on investing in reliable people. I'm going to find the right people here. One of the things I've done in, in ministry over the years, and now it's been, oh, what, 28, since 1993 I've been pastor. I've often hired people that were similar to me, and that was a mistake. I started hiring people that were opposite to me. Amen. Because I had to start staffing my strengths. Therefore, the people that are around me are stronger than I am. Amen. I'm strong in my area. They're strong in their area. So I started finding those people. That was the best thing for me. When I first started, I missed you when I first started pastoring. Uh, people that were toxic showed up, and I thought, dear God, I'm never going to survive this. Amen. They're arguing. They're fighting. Amen. They're fussing all the time. Uh, they, they, they're trying to uh, uh, divide. Uh, this one wants a title. Uh, that one's mad that that one got a title, but this one here was longer, been here longer in church than this one had been here longer in church, but they don't realize that this one here's a giver, amen, this one here's a taker, and it was like, oh, Jesus, please help me, God, I'm going to get a, I'm going to sell cars. And now I'm still at it, because what happened, God taught me to start investing my life into people who are worthy to be invested in. And as I started doing that, things started changing. In other words, the term was, high-impact people. Find high-impact people. Pour your life into them, Jody. And when you do that in high-impact, they're able to help the low-impact. Because low-impact, they just need a little help sometimes, amen, to get back up on their feet. But if I had to pour all my life in low-impact over and over and over forever, I'd never had time to deal with it. And then the high-impact get frustrated mad at you because they deserve, they deserve, amen, some time. They deserve some training. They deserve some of you. So that was important in my life to learn how to do that. Next here, don't allow someone who is running their life, to, ruining their life to ruin yours as well. Leave work at work if you can. Amen. Leave family, drama, family gatherings if you, if you can. Let me tell you this. Don't chase a prodigal. Prodigals can become toxic. You can have people in your life, family, children, stepchildren, people that you're guarding over. They can become toxic, and they can get mad at you, and they can demand things of you because they think because they're blood or they're in your house that they deserve that. And because of that, you know, I, I never had a spirit about me that I ever said I deserved anything my dad owned or my mother had or any of the land they had, anything they got. I've never said it. I got a thermos, I got a banjo, and I got a, a, a wooden level when my dad died and a pinky ring. My mom gave me a pinky ring last time I was home. I don't wear it. I don't look good with pinky rings. But it was my daddy's, and it meant something to me. But that's all, you know, that was up to her to do what she wanted to do. I've never demanded anything from my family. And, and for my kids, they'll receive whatever I decide to give them. But a, a prodigal will try to take from you, amen, and as the prodigal father, as the Scripture said, he released him and let him go. He was toxic, amen. But he went out and he learned a great lesson. My father's flunkies, fair, far finer. Amen, I'm going back home. And he got up from the pig pen, he went back. Then the dad met him. And the dad was excited and killed the fatted calf, and they celebrated, and they had a party. Beware the older brother spirit that gets upset because the backslider comes home. If somebody comes back into this church, thank God for them. Celebrate them when they come back. Well, they've been out there sinning. I know. They've been doing exactly what you wish you were doing. Amen. Put your hand down. Give God praise. Amen. Amen. That's the best thing to do. So don't allow somebody who's ruining their life, ruin yours. Thank God that we never have to pretend crazy isn't crazy. Every now and then I see somebody, I don't act like they're not crazy. You're crazy. If you're talking to yourself too much, I said too much, it's okay to talk to yourself. The Bible says speak to yourself in spiritual psalms and hymns. That's okay. But then you start answering yourself. You're crazy. And there are different levels of crazy. 
Amen? But don't pretend it's not crazy. You, you got to be able to talk. Sometimes we live by the truth, and we should all the time, not sometimes, all the time. We don't have to pretend that toxic people aren't that. We just have to learn a non-toxic way of interacting with them. I don't have to be crazy to be around crazy. Amen. And don't allow your life to become toxic. Don't allow your life to become toxic. Deal with anger when it happens. Deal with hurt when it happens. Amen. Hear that as a warning because you'll go down a road you can't come back from. Amen. You'll, you'll start hurting and hating people. People that fall away from God, that turn my king, get backslid, that walk away from God are those who get hurt, that can't deal with it, doesn't deal with it properly, they get bitter, amen, and they start hating. I'll hear they hate me. And I'll say, how did they hate me? All I was was good to them. You didn't, they didn't leave the church when they, because they hated me. They were mad at Joseph. <laughs> the next thing I know, it's me. What was, why me? That's what hurt does. This is a vast topic. How long we stay on it, what we do with it, we'll, we'll see. But I'm just telling you, and I'm warning you, don't allow hurt to lead you down a road of bitterness and murder. And Jesus said, if we, we think it in our heart, we've already done it. Amen. Repent of that. When, when I look at this man, Judas, Jesus' relationship with Judas teaches us how to deal with backstabbers and thieves and liars, extremely challenging people. Judas's life at the very end, he was unknown by his friends. He was with Jesus and all the disciples for three years. It wasn't known. When I'm around people, I want to get to know them. I want them to get to know me. But how can you spend three years? I'm not talking about just on Sundays. I'm talking about all week long, and they not know you. He was unknown by his friends. His friends never, he, he kept a shield up to where they never got to know him. Amen. They didn't realize what a toxic man he was. He was unfaithful to his Lord. Three years, all the miracles. I believe, I believe that Judas cast out devils. Because the scripture talks about it. He's, Jesus said, don't rejoice because you cast out devils. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. Judas was a part of that group. I believe miracles happened in Judas's life. I believe he saw miracles. But just because you had miracles and saw miracles, do not mean you can't go down a road that you can't come back from. He was unmourned in his death. When he died, he died alone. He hung himself. He took his own life. He landed in a spot. His body literally exploded after days of rot. He landed in a place, and they bought that place with a silver that he got. Can't take it with you. They bought that and called it a potter's field. And that's where he was planted. Oh, heads bowed, eyes closed. Spirit of God, we need healing. We need heal from the destructive influence of hurt. Feeling slighted. And God, we want you to take away the toxicity from our lives. We're not asking you to remove the people. Right now, we're asking you to remove the symptoms of toxicity in our lives. Let us first deal with us. Let us first deal with the moat in our eye before we start pointing out things of other people. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to take this message and put it in our hearts. Let it affect our lives. Lord, as we get around toxic people that we can't walk away from, help us understand the truth will set us free. Oh, we can speak truth to crazy. Yeah, we can talk to it. Amen. We can talk to them. And we can believe God also that there'll be times that you're going to put reliable people in our lives to spend more time with than dealing with the same old, same old all the time. The Spirit of the Lord would tell you right now, don't answer that phone. Don't open that door. Amen. If they mean, walk away. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise in here.